In this video, we'll talk about how people discovered that the Earth is a sphere and how they measured the diameter of that sphere. Many people think that the person who first guessed that the Earth was spherical was watching a ship gradually disappearing over the horizon. However, the Earth is too large for such observations, especially those made with the naked eye of a telescope, to be truly convincing. And also, if everything stemmed from watching ships, then probably all ancient peoples living along the shores of different seas would have come to the idea that the Earth is a sphere. But historians of science know that only the ancient Greeks arrived at this thought. We don't know who was the first to dare to consider the Earth a sphere. But historians of science know that only the ancient Greeks arrived at this thought. We don't know who was the first to dare to consider the Earth a sphere. Maybe it was Pythagoras, or one of his students, or perhaps Parmenides but we do know well the arguments they made in support of this idea. Maybe it was Pythagoras, or one of his students, or perhaps Parmenides. However, we do know the arguments they made in support of this teaching, because these arguments have come down to us in the work of Aristotle called On the Heavens. And the first of these arguments is related to long-distance travels, to the north and to the south. The Greeks sailed across the entire Mediterranean and Black Seas, they also ventured north, beyond the Pillars of Hercules. And they knew that the night sky in the northern latitudes looks different from that in the southern ones. This is what the northern part of the night sky looks like from the southern African coast of the Mediterranean Sea. The north star on the handle of the Little Dipper is located quite low above the horizon here. And if you sail north, the north star rises higher and higher and this is what the night sky will look like in the northern Black Sea region. And this proves that the Earth is round, at least from north to south. Observers at different latitudes on Earth will see completely different constellations overhead. And an observer at the North Pole will see the North Star directly overhead, while an observer at the Earth's equator will see it on the horizon but the globe had to be drawn smaller here compared to the night sky. And here we certainly need to talk about the predictive power of science. It's clear that none of the ancient Greeks had been to the North Pole or the equator. However, now they knew from their theoretical model what the night sky would look like in these latitudes. The second argument is also astronomical in nature, and it is based on observations of the Earth's shadow that the moon enters during lunar eclipses. What's important is that the edge of this shadow is always round, which means that the object casting this shadow is round from all sides. But how do we know that this shadow is cast by the Earth? The thing is, lunar eclipses always happen during a full moon, just like solar eclipses always occur during a new moon, when the sun, earth, and moon are all in a straight line. Well, next, we need to understand that thoughts about the spherical shape of the Earth lead to the most unexpected conclusions, which are quite difficult to accept. These conclusions suggest that the Earth hangs unsupported in the cosmic void and doesn't fall anywhere, that on the other side of the Earth there could be antipodes who walk upside down in relation to us, and that the bottom for both them and us is at the same point in the center of the Earth. It took the ancient Greeks some time to get used to these ideas, and when they got used to them, they said to themselves that since the Earth is a sphere, this means that this sphere has dimensions, and it would be great to take and measure these dimensions. We don't know which Greek astronomer first estimated the globe's size. However, surviving texts reveal how Eratosthenes of Cyrene, a renowned scientist and director of the Library of Alexandria, measured Earth's circumference and diameter. This library was the main scientific institution of that time. He conducted his measurements as follows. Living in Alexandria, south along the Nile was Sien, now Aswan. Eratosthenes made his measurements in the following way. As mentioned earlier, he lived in Alexandria, and south of Alexandria along the Nile was the city of Siene, now known as Aswan. Eratosthenes knew that the distance from Alexandria to Siene is 5,000 stadia. He also knew that on the day of the summer solstice, the sun is directly overhead in Siene at noon, so no vertical pole casts a shadow at that moment. And Alexandria lies to the north, and the direction to the sun makes an angle with the local vertical of one-fiftieth of a full arc of a circle. 
And then, Eratosthenes said, this angle between the direction to the sun and the local vertical is exactly equal to the angle between the directions from the center of the earth to Syene and to Alexandria. So, the distance from Alexandria to Syene is 1.5 times the full circumference of the globe. And to find this circumference, you need to multiply 5,000 stadia by 50, and we get 250,000 stadia. And how much would that be if we convert it to kilometers? Unfortunately, we do not know what stages Letosthenes used. The stages could be different in different cities. If we take the stadia to be 180 meters, the circumference of the Earth would be about 45,000 kilometers. According to modern data, it's roughly 40,000 kilometers. So, Eratosthenes' result can be considered quite accurate for those times. And just imagine, this result was obtained by observing from two cities that aren't really that far apart, just about a thousand kilometers. After all, for such a measurement, there's no need to travel all the way around the Earth. But now Eratosthenes knew exactly what distance someone would have to cover if they decided to travel around it. And now I want to ask you our traditional final question. We have seen that both pieces of evidence that the Earth is a sphere are based on astronomical observations. But let's assume that the earthly sky was always covered with dense clouds, like on Venus. So the question arises, could we discover that the Earth is round without traveling around it and without going beyond those clouds? Share your thoughts on this in the comments for this video on YouTube.